Assembly. That moment when things come together. Unless you're in high school, then it means something completely different. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. We are working on this side table. We're coming down to the final few videos in building this and I'm really loving how this is going. I've um, been really trying to dive in and do some more detailed videos on the information that is needed to create one of these for yourself. Uh, we're going to be actually talking about the assembly today and that is um, putting in the drawboards, uh, creating the fake tenons for the end here, uh, and the little things that are needed to fit this together. How does this actually come together in reality? How do the pieces fit together? And so it's, it's, it's the really fun time where this all comes together and the nice thing about it is there's no rush to it because you're not working with glue and having to get things set up and put the clamps on it. And so it's a chance where you can kind of relax and put it together. Have a little bit of fun. So let's dive in and take a look at how this is gonna go. Okay, so now it is time to start working on the assembly. And we need to do draw bore tenons into, the, uh, into all of the legs. And basically, I have an entire video on doing draw bore tenons, so if you wanna see that in detail, what you, you can go do that. So the first thing we're gonna do is drill a hole straight through where the through tenon goes through, all the way through. And then, with that hole there, we're going to grab the tenon that goes in that hole, slide it into that hole, and then use that hole to mark the tenon location. Once we do that, we're gonna pull the tenon back out, we're gonna find that mark, and then we're gonna move the drill bit ever so slightly towards the shoulder. And this will make those holes out of center. So when we drive a pin down through, it will suck that together and that pin will actually kind of bend through the hole. It puts a good deal of stress on it, but it's an extremely strong joint that won't come out. The first thing I need to do before, start, before I drill any holes is I'm gonna drill a few test holes, which I've done here. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with boring holes. Sorry, I had to do that one. <laughs> Um, but I, I've had a few bits and I just I found one that was close to my oak dowel and I'm looking for a hole that takes a good deal of force to pound in. I, I don't want this to be a loose joint. I want it to actually take some force to move around. And this, you know, it takes a good bit to pound. It's not something that it's not something that slides in finger tight. It's it's a, it's a good solid hole and that will allow it to fill out easily and uh, give it a really nice clean surface. So once we have the drill bit that we're going to use, we have our dowel, then we need to mark our locations on these. And for most of these, they're going to go straight through. Um, especially the ones in the front here are going to go all the way through. They'll be flush cut off on the inside, um, and then that will be, will be the new joint. These ones we have, we have the fake tenon, which we'll be making that in a little bit. That fake tenon will be one of the last things we do because some of these tenons sticking out will be sticking out a good ways too far. We'll take that chunk that we cut off and use it for the fake tenon when it goes in here. For the fake tenon, we're actually going to be drilling in a draw bore hole, but we're only gonna drill it in about a half inch, pound a dowel into that, and that will become a, a fake draw bore, I guess. <laughs> Um, just to keep up the look so that you have a through tenon and a draw bore peg, a through tenon and a draw bore peg. On the back legs, um, we have to be a little more careful here because in this case, here is the hole and we're gonna draw bore through here. So it's gonna go through here and then it's gonna go through a little bit of material at the bottom here. So there isn't gonna be a huge amount of support on the back, um, which, isn't a, which isn't a major problem because the, the force on the peg will be in this direction, not in this direction. So we'll, we'll be able to work with that. And we're gonna drill the hole all the way through. But when we pound the peg through, we're only gonna pound the peg up until it gets flush with the bottom of this mortise. Uh, that way, when we put the tongue in there, the tongue doesn't hit that peg coming through. So I'll cover that when we get to it. The first thing we need to do is mark out where these need to be. So for these top ones, we have a half inch up here at the top, and then these tenons are two inches long. So in order to be in the middle of that, it needs to be a, a, one inch down from the top of the tenon, so that means an inch and a half from the top of the peg. So I will set this marking gauge at an inch and a half and put a pin in right about where I think halfway is. I'm gonna fix that up in a minute. and then. On these other ones, I'm going to have to put a mark down uh, that is the half inch plus the two inch plus one inch. So it means three and a half inches total down, which I have this currently set at. So this will put a mark three and a half inches down. So what I want to do is just 
guess at where halfway is and put in a pin. That guess is going to be inside of the, the mark. Once I get all of these guesses in, then I can come in and mark what the actual width is in from the outside. So the next thing I'm going to do is put a marking gauge at 3 quarters inch, and that will put a mark in exactly halfway. So what I want to do is then put that pin in right next to that hole, that mark I made earlier, and then mark the actual location of where the center of that hole needs to be. And I'm really going to drive that in and provide a good heavy mark. If I have a hard time seeing that, I might grab an awl and make that hole a little bit bigger just to identify that it's the right mark and not the other one. And I'm going to redo that on all of these, and now I have a starting location for the drill bit. Okay, so now we need to start drilling the holes. And the one I the bit I found that fits this the best is this spiral bit. I would much rather have an auger bit, but unfortunately this is the one that fits it the best. So we have to work with this. In this case, I like to actually have a scrap piece of wood to drill into so that I'm not going to be blowing out the other side of the wood. And I can put that point right into that dimple and start slowly, um, especially with having this um, bit in here. I want to be very slow as I puncture the side so I'm not ripping it apart. And then I'm going to be working very closely at keeping this vertical. I'm going to look at it this way, I'm going to look at it this way, and it's most important to be looking at it in line with the leg, but it's good to check both directions. And so we're just going to go all the way through. And it's going to pop out into the tenon cavity here in a moment. Ooh. Because I have this held in place so well, I actually want to put a flag on here so I don't go through my my backing board and into my bench as well. <laughs> Just because, oops, been there, done that. <laughs> so once I get down close to that flag, yeah, we're at depth. So in this case, um, I've had a lot of people asking me about having hex heads in the braces. Some braces um, have no problem at all with these hex heads. Some of them have a very big problem with them as opposed to the tapered square. This is a Miller Falls that I got a while ago and I really like it. It's just a, a simple reversible um, brace and it works very well and it will hold the hex heads just as well as it will hold the square tapers. So if that's something you're looking for in a drill, um, try a hex head in there and see if it holds it well. So now we have this, we can knock it out, put the next leg in, drill the next bit, and uh, keep going. So the next thing I want to do is put each tenon one by one into its mortise and I want to clamp it in place so that I get a really nice fit right here. So that will allow me to do is grab a one step smaller bit. Um, so this is, uh, let's see, this is a number five and the hole would have been a six sixteenths. So this is a five sixteenths. So what this will allow me to do is move a half a sixteenth one side to the other. And what I want to do is I want to move towards the shoulder of the tenon. So I'm going to put this on here, I'm going to move it over, and I'm going to push it as much over that shoulder as I can, and I'm going to put in a little dimple. And then I'm going to take this off and pull this apart and I've got a small dimple in there. That dimple will then allow me to bore a hole ever so slightly closer to this so that these holes don't line up. So when I put a pin through there it's going to want to pull this farther into the joint and wedge this whole thing together. So I'm going to bore this hole through and then show you when it comes time to putting the, uh, the pins together. So now if you look down in there, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, you will see more of the tenon on this side, and you can see that little rim of it right there, and it wraps up around to this side. And so these holes are out of line. So when I drive that pin through there, it's going to want to push this tenon over there, and it's actually going to deform that pin around that joint. So number one, that pin won't ever be able to come out of there. And number two, it'll suck up this joint and pull this tight up against there. And you have a really nice, crisp, clean line right there because of a draw bore. Okay, so now everything is done and built and it's time to start the assembly and we're about to start putting in all of the legs and stretchers and do the draw bore and do all the, the final things that need to go to glit this all together. But before doing that, I want to go over every surface and clean it down. I want to get rid of all the pencil marks. I want to chamfer the edges ever so slightly, knock down the corners and make everything 
beautiful and give it that, that final touch that everything needs just one or two passes of a very very light wispy shaving and that means I'm going to be sharpening my favorite smoothing plane and over the process of doing this table I'm probably going to sharpen this plane three maybe four times um, to get through this whole process and it's not going to take that long um, I, I just want to make sure that I have the absolute sharpest keenest um, edge on this blade so that my cuts I can trust. Even if I do have to go against the grain momentarily, I know that this is sharp. And so I'll probably end up doing like, you know, 75 strokes or so with the plane and then I'll stop and resharpen it. Even though to 99% of the work, the blade's still really nice and sharp. I wanna keep this as keen as I possibly can. So I'm not gonna go into the sharpening detail. There's a lot of other videos on that, but I just wanna talk that through. When I'm doing the, the final smoothing on everything, I keep this as sharp as I possibly can. And I have a whole video on setting up this plane, uh, the Veritas uh, um, custom hand plane. I really like this. It has a 50 degree frog, so it's a little bit higher than normal. Um, and it, the settings on this, I can keep a very, very small mouth. I can keep the chip breaker right up on the edge and just have everything as, as, as finely set on this as I can possibly make it so that I can trust every smooth sh shaving is going to leave that, that buttery, wispy shaving. So I'm going to go sharpen this, come back and show you what I do and uh, we can actually start assembling this today. So now it's time for smoothing, and so I wanna go over every single piece before assembly and smooth it all down, make it all buttery and clean. And so I'm gonna be looking at the grain, making sure I'm going with the grain. And smoothing is not about flattening. The boards are flat, and they're as flat as they're going to get. Smoothing is about hitting all those tiny little bumps and ridges and nicks and getting out anything you don't want in there. It's just about taking wisps off. And it's not even about taking wisps off end to end. You can see here I'm hitting in some places and not in others. Just want to go down until I get rid of a couple marks that I have in here. I need to go a little deeper. I don't want to go any deeper than I have to because I want to keep these with very light shavings. And that's why having a smaller plane is often useful. I have thought about getting a number two just for this purpose, but haven't brought myself to expend that much money on it yet. And I'm not taking off much of anything at all. These are just about as light as you can possibly get with oak. I get this really nice glassy smooth surface that's ready for finish. And so I'm just gonna do that to all the surfaces, clean them all up, take off any pencil marks, smooth out the boards. So the next thing I need to do is build uh, several of the pins. And what I wanna start with is I'll chamfer off the end and I'm just going to lightly chamfer it all the way around. This just makes it a little bit easier to slide in past the uh, kitty wampus tenon in the middle. Once I've gone all the way around a little ways, then I'm going to randomly cut off a little more than two inches or so. And then repeat the process. And I'm going to need eight of these pins total although two of them can be a little shorter as those will be the fake pins that go in the, the front leg. So I'm gonna cut off all of these and then show you what I do to drive them in. Then the next thing we need to do is assemble this. So I'm going to slide this into the leg, making sure I have the right tenon in the right, oh, the right slot. I don't wanna be messing these up much. I don't wanna really be messing them up at all. And then I have this cloth down here so that I can do some pounding without dinging up or damaging into the wood. I made this mallet a while ago. It's like a joiner's mallet, but I have leather on the face. And for the assembly, I really like using it. Um, except for driving in these draw bores, I like to use my joiner's mallet. It's got a little more heft. So what I want to do is I want to put this pin in um, with the rounded head first. So I'm going to slide this in, and it is a really stinking tight fit in these. That's why I have this towel down to protect the surface. Keep going until I pop out the other side. Just like that. We will trim these off and clean them up a little bit later, but for right now, they will be fine. On these front ones, there's a couple fake slots, and so that's where I just grab one of these and drive it down in. I'm not being very careful or cautious. It just needs to be a peg to fill a hole. And then I'll trim that off a little later when I trim off all the tenons. So there is a fake peg in a fake hole. 
One of the things you want to be careful about when driving the tenon into the back legs particularly is you want to drive it in um, far enough but not too far. You don't want to drive it in so far that it pops out into this open slot of the mortise. You just want it to go into the leg about a quarter inch so that it is not interfering with the quarter inch uh, tenon that has to go in this slot here. So you can just keep going around until you get them all in. It doesn't take that much work. Just got to be precise. Nice thing is you're not racing the glue. You're just fitting them in place and wiggling everything to where it needs to be. And there we have a case. All set and ready to go. Now for this bottom stretcher with this mortise and tenon joint in here, uh, there's nothing holding this from spreading apart. On the top I have these sliding dovetails. And I thought about doing a bunch of different things and making a sliding dovetail that came in from the top or a sliding dovetail that went all the way down. And I went back and forth on it and I just I wasn't very happy with them. And so what I decided to do is put this in but then to dowel in at a 45 degree angle. And so I have this eighth inch dowel, um, a little piece of oak that I have been holding onto for a while. And I've got a bit that fits it precisely. And what I'm going to do is come down here into the step. So once I put that shelf support on here, it'll disappear into this step here. And I'm going to go right back into this corner and then bore a hole back in at an angle until I go through the tenon and into the leg. And do it without tipping this whole thing over. Then once I have that run out, I can push this down in. And I want to fit so I can, I can push it all the way down in, but I don't want it to be something that I have to hammer in because it's not that strong of a joint. Just like that. Then I can come in with a chisel and chop it out. So I'm going to grab this one. I'm just going to cut it off flush in the bottom of that joint. And now, no one's ever going to see that. And it ain't ever coming loose either. Just like that. And there's a better look at it down in that corner. So it just runs at an angle through the tendon into the leg, and that ain't coming loose. So that'll just provide a little bit of strength side to side. The uh, sliding dovetail at the top will do most of it, but that's all you need right there. And so now we can put in the top stretcher, push it down into place. And we don't need to worry about pinning that down in because once this once the top slides on here, this won't be able to come out and will be locked in place with the top on. Next up, we need to trim off all of these tenons and make everything look pretty. Okay, now we have all of these tenons and pegs sticking up, and I want to cut them all down to the same thickness. So I have this cheek that I cut off of, I think it was from another project. It's a little bit thinner than quarter inch, right about where I want it to be. So what I can do is set that on there, and then use my flush cut saw to cut at that thickness. Taking my time so that everything is sticking out the same amount. I'm going to do the same thing with the tenons. And cut them all off nice and flush and smooth. And somewhere around here someone's yelling at me, Hey James, what about those fake tenons? And that's where I say, you know, this one's a little longer. I'm going to use that as one of the fake tenons and slide into that slot. Um, otherwise I can go and make them. They just need to be two inches by half inch by quarter inch or whatever's needed to fit that slot. So you can see how that just comes out and then we'll just wiggle down into this slot and with a little bit of pressure fit. There's a fake tenon ready to be trimmed up and cleaned and uh, used. Okay, so now I have these tenons uh, and the pins that I want to clean down and I've got this chisel which is one of my favorite carving chisels. It has a, a I'm guessing about a 10 degree bevel on it. Very, very very sharp. I strop it after doing every one of these tenons, um, and it's it's one of my favorites. I have used the bench chisel, the half inch, uh, and this works fairly well with a 25 degree angle on there, um, but I like it to be a little bit more shallow for this and, and take my time on it. So what I want to do is just start back here at the corner, just nick off the corner, and slowly work my way down to the other end. This one is a bit sloppy. There's some wiggle in here because I'm clamping it to the bench down below. Um, this allows me to then slowly work along here. I'm trying not to take off too much at a time. Just want to take a thin shaving off. And I'm usually going to stop just before getting to the other side here. Because I don't want to blow out that end. So let's come back here, grab a little bit. And 
just keep running this down. I'm cutting it about a 45 degree angle all the way along here. And some people like to take this angle all the way down to the wood here. I like to leave a little bit exposed still, so you can still see the rectangle of the tenon underneath. This particular one is a harder tenon than some. Oh, well, it's because this one actually has some burl in it. It was originally close to a branch, and so the grain swirls a little bit, making it a little harder. So a couple more passes like that. So now that I've cleaned everything up to this corner, I want to turn around, bevel down, and then do the exact same thing right back to where I was. Bevel down just gives you a little bit more control. It allows me to bend over the other side. I usually start on the side of the tenon that's away from me. Sometimes with a little bit of slicing cut, I'm taking off a bit more than I should right now. So now I've cleaned up all the way along this. A little bit there. Now I want to do the ends, and with the ends I can start back here. And now I don't, don't have to be worried about blowing out because I've chamfered off that side already. It's already at 45 degrees, so I'm not going to have much issue with popping fibers off. And I just want to go down until the corners meet. Do the same thing on this end. And then I'm going to come back onto my side and do the same thing over again, sliding from one end to the other. Just taking off little bits at a time until I get back to where I want to be. Once I've made all four sides and I got this nice point, I actually like to go and shave off that point just a little bit right across the top. A lot of people like to leave that point on there. I like to take it off and just add one more facet to this whole piece. Just taking a tiny bit right off the tip. I like the way that looks. Just like that. And you can see how I left some on the side so you can still see some of the rectangle. I like that. Then with these pegs, I'm going to do basically the exact same thing. I'm going to shave off one side almost all the way. Taking my time. Ooh, I just blew out. See, that's what happens when you blow out the other side. You get these chips off. It happens every now and then. Oh well. I could come in and super glue them back in, but I'm not going to. I don't try to hide my mistakes. I let them shine. <laughs> Then I can come in from the other side, trim off this side, one facet all the way down, then I can come back over here, trim off this side, then do the other side, and then do the last side. Just keep going around until it looks pretty, until all four sides look fairly symmetrical, and then nick off the tip. There's the shape I'm looking for. Not that hard to do, and it's fairly simple to learn and pick up on. Okay, so now it's time for the moment of truth. This is probably the most stressful question to me because I have not put the carcass on to the top since it has been put together. So I don't know how well this is going to slide together. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. So we're gonna line everything up. And hopefully, <laughs> yes, that, that, that there, that makes me happy. <laughs> yes, that makes me very, very, very happy. <laughs> so I can set it onto the front, and then very carefully with the right mallet, which I don't have, tap this down on slowly. I've got this soft block of box elder. I think that's about it. Perfect, that's what I'm looking for all the way around. Nice, clean fit. And yes, happy. So there we have it. Now we have a table and there's no glue holding this together. So when I made the video about the drawer pull, I went and installed it right onto the door drawer front. And I wish I hadn't done that, because <laughs> I still need to smooth out this whole face uh, once I get this all together. And now I'm gonna have a hard time planning around that door pull. So I, I thought about drilling it out, removing it, and making a new one, uh, but I'm gonna work around it. I made a mistake, well, I'm gonna have to live with it. 
So we're going to start the assembly here, and I'm going to be putting all of these in this place, setting everything in, wiggling it all down, making sure that it is the right way. Oops, let's do it this way. And getting it all in. Now, I did not smooth out the outside of this box when I did all the smoothing of everything else. I just, um, addressed, the out just, just addressed the inside of the box. So here's the part where I'm going to get a lot of people saying, you did it wrong. You put the dovetails on, on backwards, and which I say, no, I intended to put them on this way. Now, if I were to leave this like this and not do anything more, then this might become a problem. This will eventually wiggle loose. Uh, though it's going to take a good bit. These are they're really, really tight in there, so it's not a huge issue. But what I want to do to actually um, address these is I'm going to put a pin through these pins and then into the tailboard. So one, two, three, four, and then just to make it safe, I'm going to do the exact same thing on here, through the pin into the tailboard. And to make sure that this is all together, I'm going to go ahead and clamp it all together as if I were gluing it. And in that case, then I will drill out the holes. So let me go ahead and clamp this, and then I'll take you through what I do for gluing that up. And then the last thing we're going to have to do is smooth out this, bring all these surfaces level, and then fit this to the actual slot in the box. So let's clamp this together and go from there. So now we can come in after we've clamped this all up and squeezed it tight. And I can put this in and drill a hole. And I want to drill it all the way through the pin and into the front board. Then once we have that in there, we can simply drive in a pin. Then flush cut that off and we'll be ready to go. Now before we put the drawer into the slot, we need to put the drawer slide into its slot. And so this then just goes back into that tab in the back stretcher, and I push it all the way back in, and then I can fit it between the legs and slide it down into place until it fits. We got a good smooth surface here and here, and now we have a slide on both sides that captures both bottom corners of the drawer. So the drawer can't move side to side and it can't fall out. If it needs to, it can go up, but there's no problem in that. Okay, so I put all the pins through the pins into the main board. And this is now a solid drawer and no glue, but it ain't coming apart. I haven't done anything other than flush cutting them off. This is all still raggeded. You can see where the pins and tails stick out a hair more on either side. Nothing has been smoothed on the outside of this. So if I were a machinist and this were metal, this will fit perfectly. But I'm not a machinist and this is not metal, so it won't. Um, but let's find out. Um, actually, that's better than I expected. Okay, we're hitting a jam here. So it looks like it's tight here. And... We're hitting the leg back here. So actually this drawer isn't that bad, other than the fact that the front face here is a little high and I can see that it's higher than the side wall here. And the back, um, what I need to do is just taper off the back corner a little bit so it slides past the leg. So I'm going to show you what I do to trim up, clean up, and smooth up these slides, and we'll see how it fits after that. So when I work on the sides of drawers, what I like to do is clamp them in the leg vise, but then put two clamps to the bench. If I had a moxen vise that were wide enough, I'd probably use that, but my, wax, my moxen vise is not wide enough for this. It's about that size. So one of these days I might make a really big moxen vise or a big joinery bench, uh, but until then, I just clamp this to it. I don't do this a whole lot, and so, yeah, it's kind of a pain when you're actually working on it, but other times it really doesn't matter at all. So the first thing I want to do is smooth out this whole surface. Any of the pins or tails that are sticking up higher, I want to flatten them down. And I'm going to take my smoothing plane, the same one that I use for everything else, and I'm just going to give it a nice smooth surface all the way across, cleaning off all those pins, all the drawboard dowels, and getting a really nice, crisp, smooth surface all the way across. Now here I'm going to be going against the grain, but with that nice tight setup, it's not as much of a problem. The other thing I want to do is at the back of the drawer, I want to take the last inch or so and just kind of taper it off a little bit because I want to make the very back of the drawer slightly smaller. That way when it slides up against that leg, if there's any movement or flex in the drawer in the future, um, it will slide past that leg. So to do that, I'm just going to set this like that. Just 
just give it a slight angle to it. So this has only been dropped eh, less than a sixteenth of an inch, just enough to make it a little bit of a bull nose. And that's all we need to do right there. We just round this back corner just a hair. Just like that. And that is ready to go in. I'm going to do that to all four sides, and uh, then I'll bring you back and show you what I do for the top and bottom. Some people like to fill these quarter by quarter grooves where the drawer bottom sticks through. Um, I really don't like to because I like to leave them open. Maybe I'm lazy, but maybe I just kind of like seeing what the joinery was and how things were done. If you do want to peg them, they're not that difficult. You just cut a piece of ingrain quarter by quarter, drive it down in there, and uh, fill it up. But I like to leave them open, so that's my personal preference. Whatever you want to do, fine by me. Now for the top, number one, because I have this really heavy figured wood, and number two, I have this knob here, I'm actually going to use a card scraper and clean up the wood that way. As soon as I can find my burr. So when I clean up the top and bottom rim, I like to use these uh, cutoffs that I have left over from when I do cheeks and joinery. Um, and these make great protectors for the dogs and the bench. And I just want to go all the way around this and trim it all up until it's all nice and flat and even. And when I come to the corners, I'm going to be skewing it at 45 degrees so that I'm going 45 degrees to both grain, um, grain directions. That way I'm not running across any grain. And get a really nice, clean, smooth surface to all these joints feel nice. And that is about it for that. The only other thing I'm going to do while I have it here is I'm going to chamfer the bottom just with a light chamfer, two passes or so, just to lighten up that edge, just a hair. There's the bottom, flip it over, do the exact same thing on the top, and this drawer will be ready for testing. So, now that we've done all that, let's test it and see how close we come. Oh, that's happy. So the last thing I needed before um, actually finishing this is to balance it out. And no matter how well you do, usually one of the legs is slightly longer than the other or they're ever so slightly out of center, um, especially with this having the, the drawboard tenons, there's a, there's a bit of a, a twist in them occasionally, um, not having a second stretcher down below. So one of these uh, is about an eighth inch higher than the other. Now what I could do is I could put a level on the top and find out precisely where level is and trim off two of these legs. Or I can balance it onto three, and so I've got the back two touching and the front one touching. And then I can put in a bunch of paper underneath until I get it to level. And we can find out, there, that's level. So I need this many sheets of paper. So what I can do is then grab my calipers, pull out that paper, and take a measurement. So I need to take off 0.11 off of the other front leg. Basically all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop those two front legs just a hair. Um, that might make the top ever so slightly out of balance, but I don't really care because no one's ever going to notice that. If this is set on carpet, which it will be most of the time, um, it, carpet's going to throw it out of range in other ways. So I need to cut this leg off by 0.11. Let's do so. So what I want to do is lock the caliper at that measurement and then mark in that distance several points along here. And that will then tell me where I need to cut. Then I can grab my saw, slide the whole table over until it's in line with that. Yes, I know there's a taper on here, but it's really not that much of a taper. And it's right at that amount where I could probably use it at the shooting board plane, or I could use the saw. So let's cut this and see what we get. So now we've cut that much off. So now we need to reinstall that taper on the end of this. 
Now we can give it a little bit of a test and those are pretty darn solid. I will take that. Voila! It is built. Now it's time to finish it. So now you have a side table sitting on your bench. It is together and you are happy, and so am I. If you'd like to follow along with this build, I will leave links to the uh, plans for this, which I have on my website. Uh, you can see those down below. This is really turning into a large and fun project. It's a very good one for the beginning woodworker because there's so many different joints and methodologies and things like that. And once you kind of wrap your brain around this project, you can do most any other project out there. Uh, a lot of tables are just a scaling of this particular thing, making a stretchers longer or the top bigger. And uh, once you do this, you can do a lot of other things in woodworking. So I do want to say thank you to the patrons on Patreon. You guys are the reason why I can keep doing these more detailed builds where we dive into them and really make something happen. Uh, if you'd like to help out with Patreon or find more about that, you can do so right down there. Also, if you'd like to subscribe and see some behind the scenes footage, you can do that as well. That's about it for today. Until next time, have a wonderful day.